Before the existence of mortals, the gods were known as the Atada, or the original spirits. Prior to Lorcan's conception of Mundus, nothing separated the Divines from the Daedric Princes. However, Lorcan called upon the original spirits to aid him in realising his vision, creating his new realm. The original spirits who assisted him became bound to Mundus. Large portions of their power were invested in the makeup of the mortal plane, and they were unable to leave, confined eternally to their creation. The original spirits who denied Lorcan were not held captive by Mundus, and they left freely with all of their power intact. This one simple decision is what separates the Aedra from the Daedra. In the Aldmeri tongue, Aedra means our ancestors, for their power was utilised in the birth of the Elnafe and eventually the mortals of Nern. Daedra, on the other hand, means not our ancestors, for they devoted nothing to the realm of men and myrrh. It's amusing how a single decision led to such contrasting forces. Through the context of the mortal lens, the Aedra and the Daedra are polar opposites. The Aedra care for mortals, as they are innately invested in the well-being of the mortals who dwell in the realm of Mundus. They are ingrained in the very fabric of the plane. Whereas the Daedra, the Daedra refuse to help Lorcan, and therefore have a disconnected relationship with Mundus. They have no physical stakes in the welfare of mortals. They can leave at will, and meddling with humanity, myrrh and beast kind has no consequences for them. That very fact leads many of the Daedric Princes to torture and torment mortals, considering them their playthings, to be used at their leisure and then tossed aside without a second thought. For this reason, I would like to pose the possibility that the most unlikely of the Daedric Princes is actually the most dangerous to the best interests of Mundus and its inhabitants. That Daedric Prince is the legendary mischievous scallywag named Sanguine. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. In case it wasn't obvious, we here at Fudge Muppet are quite fond of the Elder Scrolls series. And for me personally, the most interesting aspect of the universe and its lore is the collection of characters known as the Daedric Princes. Every interaction between mortals and these lords ends unpredictably, for their presence on Mundus defies the very laws of nature. In this series, we're going to go in depth into all of these princes, and we're going to start with my favourite, the Daedric Prince of Debauchery and Hedonism, Sanguine. So as I was saying just a moment ago, the Aedra and the Daedra, while spawning from the same origins, act as opposing forces. If the Aedra, or the Divines as they are commonly known in modern times, are the gods, the angelic deities, then the Daedric Princes are like devils, the demonic deities. They are the yin to the Aedric yang. The flawed yet balanced nature of mortals is nicely summed up by the presence of both of these forces. Inside every man, myr and beast there is a duality, good and evil, light and dark, benevolence and sadism, two divergent influences constantly at odds with each other. I'll try to avoid getting too philosophical with this video, but bear with me because it's this fact about mortals that makes them so fascinating, and makes Sanguine much more sinister than he seems at first glance. Before going further, let's talk about the prince in question. Sanguine is the bro of the Daedric Lords. He is the immortal representative of debauchery. He indulges mortal weaknesses, allowing the darker nature of man, myrrh and beast to bubble to the surface. He encourages the sacrilegious sins of lust, gluttony, sloth and greed. And in that regard, he is the antithesis of productivity, human ingenuity and advancement. But why is this so bad? With all this in mind, it seems that you'd be hard pressed to find a Daedric Prince more good than Sanguine. On second thought, less bad is probably a better term than good, but you catch my point. We have princes like Boethia, the prince of deceit, murder and treason. We have princes like Mehrunes Dagon, bent on precipitating revolution. He's the catalyst for carnage and destruction. Then we have the most egregious of the lot, we have princes like Molag Bao, whose one burning desire is to enslave and dominate all mortals. By comparison, Sanguine is your best mate. He's all about hedonistic revelry, the loosening of inhibitions, and the never-ending celebration. You'd think mortals would seek him out rather than run in fear, and oftentimes that's exactly what mortals do. Yet despite this, there are very few Daedric Princes with the same potential for destroying the races of men and myrrh altogether. Mortals don't get the luxury of eternal life, and nihilism is one unpleasant thought away for men who suffer in the fields, or women who endure immense pain in the laborious process of expanding the population. What's to stop these hard-working sods from giving it all up? What if they collectively come to the conclusion that it's all for nothing, and they might as well let the world burn? 
Without order, everything mortals have worked towards over the eras can be torn down at the foundations in a fraction of the time. Imagine, for instance, if the great mortals of Tamrielic history, like the heroes you'll meet in Sovngarde, had abandoned their noble and gallant goals, instead choosing to piss away their lives in brothels, taverns, and skooma dens. Tamriel, Nern, and Mundus as a whole would be a very different place in that case, and it is such dangers that frighten the divines. Many of the Aedra worshipped by mortals exist specifically in pantheons to quell such temptations. Without guidance from wise omnipotent immortal gods, chaos is only one foolish deed away from overthrowing order. Take Stendar for example. Stendar promises glory to those who abide by the law. He rewards righteousness and merciful forbearance, the very things Sanguine would work to undermine. Whether he does this intentionally or whether it is a side effect of his affinity for mortal vices is subjective. If we look at Sanguine's quest for the hero of Kvatch during the Oblivion Crisis, you'd think it's the latter. Sanguine considers the Countess of Leowin to be wound too tight, and in order to shake things up he tasks the hero with sneaking into her dinner party, casting a spell and causing all of their clothes to suddenly vanish. His response to her sour attitude was not violent or cruel, it was just a prank bro. Similarly, two centuries later, while disguised as the Breton Sam Gwaven, he subjects the Dragonborn to tomfoolery of equal calibre. Stealing a goat and marrying a hag is hardly paramount to the tasks most Daedric princes would ask of you. But no matter what Sanguine's motivations may be, one thing is clear. Sanguine seems like a barrel of fun, like a great drinking companion, and that is what makes him so deviously dangerous to flawed mortals. He can destroy legacies by corrupting good, honest men. And on top of that, he's also the driving force behind every instance of alcohol-fueled violence and brutality. He's every case of crippling drug addiction, and he's to blame for all debauchery, clouded judgement and absent inhibitions that show up after a night spent partying too hard. So, with that in mind, he's indirectly the culprit for every beaten wife, every drunken brawl, every skooma overdose. All of these wonderful byproducts of sin are the fault of the amiable, smiling Sanguine. You wouldn't think it possible that such a cheerful chum guffawing over a pint of ale could orchestrate such things. And you could argue that he does not always cause them. Maybe he truly does just love a party. But for mortals, the consequences can be disastrous. To Sanguine, a hangover is just another day of his immortal existence, whereas to mortals, humouring one's vice is a risk to oneself, one's family and one's community. So what makes Sanguine so strenuous to spurn? Why do so many give in to their baser desires when met with the charismatic prince? Well, aside from his intoxicating presence and affable charm, Sanguine can listen to his subjects' most fantastically depraved desires and make them a reality. And he achieves this through his myriad realms of revelry. These realms add up to make Sanguine's plane of oblivion. They are a collection of over a hundred thousand pocket realms. Sanguine holds dominion over these sub-realms, and he tailors each one to suit the needs of its temporary mortal inhabitants. They are used as pleasure pockets, refashioned over and over again to cater to any and all wild desires. Misty Grove is an example of one of these pockets of oblivion. This murky copse is home to all manner of wildlife. The lanterns, gently rolling streams, and the early evening glow coalesce to create an environment that banishes stress instantly. And it's easy to see how this paradise can entice even a dragonborn. And that comes back to my point about how dangerous Sanguine can be. His influence over all mortals is where things get dicey. Think of all the destruction that could have came to pass had the dragonborn been infatuated by Sanguine's seductive sorceries. Indirectly, Sanguine could have caused the desolation of Skyrim, leaving Nern unprotected from Alduin the World Eater as he brings about the apocalypse. Aside from the threads of the web spinner, which he created for the Daedric Prince Mafala, Sanguine only has one known Daedric artifact to his name. The Sanguine Rose, his artifact, is a metaphor for the chaos he brings. It is a beautifully ornate staff carved into the shape of a fawned rose, and it has the power to take on many forms to suit the beholder. It can be used to summon lesser Daedra, and the creatures conjured by it are notoriously unpredictable, capable of much unrest and destruction. Much like debauchery and overindulgence, the rose wilts with use, losing a petal every time a Daedra is summoned, becoming less and less like the desirable object it once resembled. When mortals tire of their revelry, they will see that gratuitous satisfaction is not nearly as pleasurable as a reward well earned. But by the time that reality is discovered, the wielder or indulger is already well and truly corrupted. When the rose loses all of its power, a new rose blooms somewhere in oblivion, and Sanguine plucks it before choosing a new champion to carry it. 
So long as the Daedric Prince Sanguine is amused and satiated, he will spare no sympathy for those sullied in his wake. No matter what you think of Sanguine, whether you love him or hate him, it's hard to find a more interesting encounter in Tamriel. Both encounters with the Prince, the first in 3rd era Cyrodiil and the second in 4th era Skyrim, are a hell of a lot of fun, and he's the Prince you'd want to invite to your birthday party. But you best be sure you can keep up, because even though a good time is guaranteed with Sanguine, it's also guaranteed that the next morning when your head is thumping and your mouth tastes of sick, you won't be looking at him through rose-tinted glasses. I hope you enjoyed this short think piece on the real significance of Sanguine. I had a lot of fun talking about my favourite Daedra, and I hope you learned a thing or two from it. Whether you agree with me that he's not all sunshine and roses, or whether you think he's harmless, I'd be interested to hear your favourite Daedric prints down below, and maybe I'll cover them in the next video. Thank you so much for watching guys, my name is Drew, and I'll see you later.